Mystery and Murder by James Skip Borlase. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alan Winterout. Mystery and Murder by James Skip Borlase. While in Tasmania, I met with an adventure of so singular a character that it has been the subject of much thought during my leisure hours in the intervening space of time, the more so as the mysterious portion of it remains unexplained to this day. On an evening during one of the winter months, I was seated in my quarters in Hobart Town, engaged in making memoranda of my day's occupation, when a gentleman who had requested to see me was shown into the apartment. Although he had not the slightest knowledge of me, I recognized him at once. It was Mr. Longmore, a merchant of Hobart Town, who had the character of being a steady, worthy, and withal wealthy man. He was a widower, the father of an only daughter, and resided on the outskirts of the town in a handsome residence situated very near to that part of the Derwent which bears the name of Sullivan's Cove. In fact, its waters rippled at the bottom of Mr. Longmore's own grounds. I have the pleasure of speaking to Mr. Brooke, the detective officer, I believe, said he, after having at my invitation seated himself. Yes, I replied, and you may spare yourself the trouble of introducing yourself, Mr. Longmore. I have the honor of knowing you well by sight as well as by reputation. Well, I suppose, I need not be surprised at your recognizing me, replied he with a staid smile although I do not recollect having ever met you before, but it is quite in your way to be observant. It is, sir, and now, in what manner can my present services avail you? I could not help noticing that the gentleman looked uneasy and hesitant, and not at all easy in his conversation, as I should have expected to find a man of the world as Mr. Longmore. I scarcely know what to say to you, Mr. Brooke, shifting uneasily upon his chair. I came with the purpose of disclosing to you something so extraordinary and singular as to be scarcely credible, and now I am doubly inclined to fear that its very singularity may occasion doubts in your mind as to my judgment or want of common sense. You need not be at all afraid, Mr. Longmore, I responded encouragingly, that I shall draw any false inference from any communication that you may do me the honor of making to me in confidence. Your well-known character as a gentleman of clear judgment and sound common sense is a sufficient guarantee that any information you may give me or communication you may make will be well worthy of attention. Thank you, replied he, but in this matter I am positively afraid that my ordinary judgment is at fault. But if you can afford me time, I will relate the circumstances and allow you to form your own opinion upon the matter. Of course I signify my readiness nay, anxiety to listen, and Mr. Longmore commenced thus. My house is, as I dare say you know, at this side of the suburbs, and quite near to the river. I reside in it with my only daughter and three servants, one male and two females. The house has no upper story, the front windows are French, all open onto the grounds, the back part of the establishment, stables, yard, etc., being separated from the front gardens by a high stone wall into the back yard, the kitchen and ordinary apartments open, so that unless through the house itself, no communication can be held by any of the servants with the pleasure grounds, unless indeed they were to go down and approach by the river. I tell you all this, so that you may be in the same position as I have found myself, as to the possibility of finding a natural solution of the singular difficulty which I am about to relate to you. The door of communication between the front and back portions of my house I am particularly careful to secure every night myself, my early residence in the colony having made me very cautious in guarding against surprise of any kind, and my daughter's safety is of greater moment than my own, so that I am even more careful in these matters than I might have been. This night week I had retired at my usual hour, or perhaps a little later. Everything was quiet. My daughter, as well as the servants, had gone to their rooms some time before. It was a wild, dark night, but as I burn a lamp in my room, it is of course lighted, although dimly. For some time I had been asleep, 
What awoke me I cannot tell. The first thing on which my eyes rested was a form, a figure or the semblance of one. It was standing at the foot of my bed, and it was that of a female. I was not alarmed, for the idea that it was my daughter immediately suggested itself. So I raised myself upon my elbow for the purpose of asking if anything was the matter. As soon as I did so, I instantly perceived that the face was strange to me. The figure was slight, attired in a white robe. The features had a horrible expression of terror, and their death-like power was increased by the contrast presented by the longest and heaviest black hair I ever saw, which hung over her left breast and reached down to her knees. Her dress was of silk and material, for I heard it rustling, and all over the front, and also upon the loose sleeves, it was clotted with blood. Here the narrator stopped, apparently quite overcome with the recollection of the scene that he had been describing, and I must confess that I could hardly repress a smile at such emotion being felt by a person of Mr. Longmore's sense and experience about such a piece of absurdity, and I dare say he read the expression of my feelings in my face, for he remarked, I can scarcely feel surprised that you should be inclined to treat the matter as a joke, Mr. Brook. It is a very singular story to relate, and I do not expect you to give it credence without proving its truth yourself. Oh, I hope, sir, I hasten to observe, you do not suppose for a moment that I doubt your veracity. Only, to my professional mind, the apparition looks very like a hoax which someone is playing off upon you. But if you will narrate the facts, we can talk of these things afterwards. I have very little to add. The appearance which I have described has visited me every night, in spite of barred doors and windows, each time waving its hand impatiently, as if beckoning me to follow. And you never followed? No. I must confess that I felt too horrified to attempt moving whilst the figure stood so immediately before me. I felt frozen to the bed, as it were. Indeed, I assure you, it is a fearful sight. Will you permit me to inquire, Mr. Longmore? Are you at all superstitious? In the sense you mean, I am not superstitious. If I met with anything so peculiar in appearance as to be quite beyond the ordinary run of natural events, before setting it down to be supernatural or, or apparitional, I should certainly do my utmost to find a natural cause or causes for it, as I have done in this instance. Failing in that, I am ready to acknowledge that there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in our philosophy. Still, had I been as really superstitious as you appear to think me, I should not have been here to ask your more practiced assistance in trying to unravel this mystery. Well, I replied laughingly, I am inclined to feel certain that we shall easily prove this visitation not to be one from a spiritual kingdom. For in truth, Mr. Longmore, I do not believe in ghosts. Because you have never seen one. I did not reply to this observation, as I perceived that his nerves had been much affected, and not without wonder. The appearance of such a figure in one's bedroom night after night, in spite of locks and bolts, was enough to shake any man's judgment. Nevertheless, I had not the slightest doubt that the professional cunning upon which I prided myself would expose the trick of some conspiracy, formed, I was sure, for no good purpose. Have you mentioned this to anyone, Mr. Longmore? No, I have not. I was afraid of alarming my daughter. I do sincerely hope that you will be able to get to the bottom of it. The knowledge of such an unaccountable visitation, such a horrible appearance, being night after night in the immediate neighborhood of my unsuspecting child, is almost overwhelming me. Now, what steps will you take? I considered for a moment before I answered, and then mentioned my intention of spending that night in Mr. Longmore's bedroom. Could you get in without anyone suspecting that you had a visitor, I inquired? And could you manage to let me occupy your room in secrecy also? Oh, easily enough. Only name the hour you will be at the side entrance into the garden, and I will admit you myself. It is usual after dusk for me to smoke my cigar near the river. Having made suitable arrangements, Mr. Longmore left me. I sat down and considered the matter on all sides. What was the object in thus acting the ghost in the bedroom of a man of Mr. Longmore's well-known strength of mind? From what I knew of that gentleman's character, I was much surprised at the weakness he had shown, the earthly and, I had no doubt, criminal nature of which only wanted a little keen-sighted perseverance to be proved. 
As to ghosts and entrances affected without any existing means of ingress, <laughs> bah, it was all fudge. My intention, in the first place, was to see if possible this singular apparition, and while doing nothing more than simply affecting to be the ordinary occupier of Mr. Longmore's bed. For the first night, to make good use of my eyes, and be guided in any further attempts at unravelment by my observations. Well, at the appointed time I was conducted by Mr. Longmore into his bedroom, the servants as well as Miss Longmore having retired. I was at liberty to examine the room at leisure. The apartment was a good size, perhaps 16 feet by 22, and had two large French windows that opened on a veranda which ran along the front of the house. These windows consisted each of a single sheet of plate glass in handsome mahogany framework, and faced directly the Derwent, called, as I have before mentioned at that spot, Sullivan's Cove. With its head against the wall opposite to the windows stood a large, elegant bedstead, with a canopy at the head, from which depended rich damask curtains, that only formed a shelter to the head of the bedstead, leaving the foot entirely unprotected. On the right hand of the bed was a door opening into a dressing room, which communicated with the other portion of the establishment. By the wall at the left was the toilet table. Upon it stood a deeply shaded night lamp. There was also a chimney in the room, but as the grate was one of the stove description, I did not trouble myself about it. The windows and doors I left entirely to Mr. Longmore's inspection, taking his word that they were fastened as usual. When this was all right, we seated ourselves beside a table where my entertainer had taken care to have refreshment, and after partaking of a glass of wine, I lit my cigar, begging my host to excuse my invariable practice before retiring. It had not escaped my keen observation that the gentleman on whose behalf I had volunteered to encounter a ghost had shown indubitable signs of a mind ill at ease ever since he had ushered me into his house. Taking advantage of the wreaths of smoke that soon curled up between my lips, I watched him as he sat opposite to me more closely than I should otherwise have had an opportunity of doing. He was gazing down at the floor, occasionally sipping his wine in an abstracted manner, with a thoughtful and troubled expression upon his face. But looking up once, and encountering my eyes steadfastly and I suspect searchingly fixed upon his countenance, he became red and pale by turns, and at length addressed me hurriedly. I am afraid, Mr. Brooke, that I have done wrong in this business as I have given you trouble, I think. I believe I should have told you everything. Certainly, Mr. Longmore, was my reply. If you seek my professional services, I think I have a right to learn everything you know in connection with it. It is true. It is quite true. And yet I think you will make allowance for my disinclination to speak of this circumstance. There are some things of the past so painful that I may be excused if I feel a disinclination to allude to them. Well, sir, if you regret having mentioned the subject to me, forget that you have done so, and nobody shall be the wiser. No, no, you quite mistake me. I am anxious to tell you at once of what I should have informed you before, and it is simply that this, this apparition bears the semblance of one with whom I was too well acquainted. May I ask of whom? My wife. Your wife, I exclaimed, and then checked myself at once, as the cause of Mr. Longmore's awkwardness and evident trouble of mind flashed before me. I now remembered having heard a great deal of gossip about this said wife. She had eloped years before from this very house in a most disgraceful manner and with a most unprincipled low rascal. I respected my host's feelings, of course, and felt grieved that anything should have occurred with which I had any connection to bring the memory of the transaction again before him. And you think the figure resembles that person, I inquired? It is herself, was the determined reply. Well, I must say that I think it very likely is. What more probable than that she should be acquainted with some outlet from this room which you do not know? Mr. Longmore shook his head. It is not she alive, he said. Do you then really and positively believe that this visitation is a supernatural one? I asked in much surprise. I do. I am willing that every means of discovery shall be tried, but when you have seen it, I think you will acknowledge that I must believe it is supernatural. This was very positive and very singular to me, that any man in these days of enlightenment and possessed of his full allowance of brains 
should insist upon the existence of a ghost. If I am not making a bull in so saying, was a matter beyond my comprehension. And as I turned into Mr. Longmore's stately bed, after he had taken up his quarters on a couch in the dressing room, I am afraid I allowed myself to consider for a moment how long, in all probability, it was likely to be ere this far-seeing merchant should become the inmate of an asylum, where the beds would not be half so soft, or the room so luxurious as the one which I occupied as the temporary tenant of this haunted house. My clothes I had not removed, and my revolver lay handy. Indeed, since the last communication of my host, I made up my mind to bring the matter to an end that night. This ghost, be it as active as it liked, would have to use all its supernatural power to enable it to escape from my clutches, for I had no doubt that I should succeed in grabbing the late Mrs. Longmore before she had time to invoke the powers of darkness or find her usual mode of egress. An officer of ten years' experience in the detective force was not born yesterday. And so I lay thinking over things quietly, hour after hour, striking upon the ornamental clock that stood upon the mantelpiece until it was half past one. It was a cloudy night. A chill wind blew up from the cove, which made a sighing and sad whispering among the trees that shaded the house. The lately risen moon, now streaming in through the veranda and casting shadows of vine leaves and creepers upon the carpet, shadows that waved and shook as the agitated air waved and shook the foliage outside, was occasionally obscured and left the room almost in complete darkness, as I had screwed down the lamp as low as possible. I had made up my mind by this time that the conspirator or conspirators had found out my presence in the apartment, and had thought it safer not to attempt any of their pranks upon me. At this moment the moon became cloudy. The room was nearly but not quite in darkness, when suddenly, and without any apparent reason, I had seen nothing, I had heard nothing. I felt myself getting cold, cold as the dead. And then, and not until then, I heard a rustling, as it were, of silk. Involuntarily my eyes settled upon the space at the foot of the bed, a distinct shadow was there, but only a shadow, out of which my eyes could form no distinct figure or semblance. In a second or two it grew white, whiter. At length, against the dark background, the white-dressed woman stood out visibly and clearly, the long hair hanging unfastened over her left breast, with blood spattered on the white silk of her robe. But her face, oh, how horrible! I could not help feeling it impossible for a living face to look so by any contrivance whatever. I was horror-stricken. I could not breathe. I felt as if all my faculties were frozen. My eyes were fixed on that ghostly figure, which now lifted an arm and waved as if to follow. The face of this woman, as Mr. Longmore had said, was full of combined agony and terror. Although this continued only a few seconds, I was for the time paralyzed. I made an effort, however. Am I going to allow myself to be made a laughing stock? Perhaps a touch of the pistol, which I felt at this moment against my fingers, helped to recall me to myself. At any rate, I bounded out of bed, rushed toward the figure, resolved to grapple with it to the death. It was gone. Not a moment did I lose. I pushed back the bolt of the window, near which the figure had disappeared, opened it, and rushed on the veranda. There stood the phantom on the lawn rendered now visible by the moonlight. It was still beckoning to me to come. Worked up to a frenzy, I took steady aim at this vision with my revolver. I fired, and then rushed toward it again. There it was, but a little farther off, still beckoning, and so I followed and followed, without appearing to gain on it in the slightest degree. The report of the pistol had aroused Mr. Longmore, who now joined me. The figure in white moved in the direction of the river, which, as I have before said, was in front of the house. The grounds belonging to Mr. Longmore extended down to it. The shrubbery went round a grassy hollow not far from the water, in a spot so low that it was occasionally a receptacle for the surplus rainwater that lodged in it and formed a pond. At the time I write it was quite dry, and I had only become aware afterwards from Mr. Longmore that such had frequently been the case. On reaching the center of this grassy hollow, the figure stopped until we came within a distance of about twenty yards, and then, wildly tossing its clasped hands above its head, appeared to fall prone upon the earth. 
Not only was there nothing on the ground when we reached it, but there was nothing to see nor hear on the shore or in the shrubbery. Not a vestige of anything did the most rigid search discover. And as the moon had again become invisible, Mr. Longmore and I went back to the haunted room. He was as pale as a corpse, and I freely confess I was not sorry to be helped to a glass of wine. What do you think of it? He whisperingly inquired. Let us speak of it by daylight, sir, I replied, flinging myself upon a sofa, and in truth I was positively ashamed to say what I did think of it. As soon as it was light, I commenced a thorough examination of the room. I could make nothing of it. I could not account for the entrance of the bulletproof visitant of the night. I then walked to the foot of the lawn, and sat down close to the spot where the figure had vanished. Being an inveterate smoker, I took a cigar to clear my intellect and soothe my agitation. As I smoked, I observed at the bottom of this little hollow, the ground which elsewhere was covered with a green, fresh-looking grass, strewn for a small space with a layer composed of what appeared to be a mixture of dead leaves, chips, and rushes mixed with some kind of soil. In short, just such a sediment as might have been left at the deposit of a dried-up pool. On a closer examination, I fancied I could detect signs of a late disturbance of the soil in that particular place. What could have suggested to me the idea of making a search in the ground there, I am totally unable to explain. It was one of those singularly instinctive thoughts for which there is no accounting. Certain it is, however, that I at once decided, before I took another step in the matter, to get the assistance of one of the force to examine this hollow before any person would be likely to be on the river or about to make observations on our movements. Returning to the house, I found Mr. Longmore just dressing, looking miserably pale and wretched. I felt sorry for the man, but as my silence, I had no doubt would be more grateful to him than any sympathy. I merely informed him of my intention, and taking the key of the side gate, went towards the police camp. Going along Macquarie Street, I fortunately met the very man I should have chosen as an assistant where I wished for a closed mouth. I dispatched him for tools, and when he joined me, we proceeded on our return to Mr. Longmore's. What do you expect to find, inquired that gentleman, who stood beside us when we commenced shoveling the loose soil from the place. I could only shake my head, and in a few moments my companion's spade scraped against some wooden substance. At the hollow empty sound, Mr. Longmore's face grew death-like. Perhaps you had better go up to the house, sir, I said. No, he replied with an effort. Go on. Quickly then, we uncovered a deal case with a loosely fastened, ill-fitting lid. It was about four feet long by three wide, and perhaps two feet deep. It looked like a soft goods case, which I dare say it had been. Well, we lifted it from the hole, Mr. Longmore still standing silent and inactive beside us, and I am certain that I was more surprised than either of my companions at the result of our labors, as I was the one who really knew how entirely without reasonable cause I had set to work with spade and shovel in that unlikely place. As soon as the box was set upon the ground, I prized off the rough lid with my spade and it fell over to the side, exposing a lining of zinc which was bent down without any attempt at evenness, and entirely concealed what remained below it. We unfolded it bit by bit, gradually exposing an object of horror so terrible that I wish I had never seen it. Many a night since, when some midnight duty has found me on a lonely patrol, have I fancied in the darkness the figure in that deal box. It was a dead woman, and the facsimile of the phantom that visited me in the darkness of the night before. The figure lay upon its right side, the knees slightly drawn up so as to enable it to fit in the case, and it was dressed in the identical rich white silk, every fold of which seemed familiar to me. The long, heavy black hair was loose, and gathered at one side lay scattered over the left shoulder, and upon the skirt of the blood-stained dress, and under the hair where it lay clogged and clotted, remained still the handle of a Spanish knife. The blade had passed through the unfortunate woman's heart. Although the body lay upon its side, as the space was confined, the head was turned so that the face looked upward, with the glaring wide-open eyes fixed in a look so full of fear and horror that I can never forget it. And with one glance at the well-known face, Mr. Longmore sank to the ground in a swoon. He had recognized his wife. 
it passed over in the usual way, an inquest resulting in an open verdict and a large offered reward posted on the walls and printed in the Gazette. Mr. Longmore had long left Hobart Town, glad to escape anywhere from a place so fraught with horrible memories. One night I was seated in the same room where, twelve months before, Mr. Longmore had sought and found me about this business of mysterious termination, when a tall young man of seventeen inquired for me, and gained admittance. He looked like a sailor. In his hand he held a paper which he opened and handed to me. It was one of the posters to which I have alluded commencing under the offered reward with the usual whereas, etc. The paper was torn and partly destroyed, but not sufficiently to hinder one from perusing the principal parts of it. I suppose you remember that, sir, said the young man. When I replied in the affirmative, he entered into the following narrative, which I shall give as nearly as possible in his own words. I only came to this port last night, and today I went into a shop to buy some toggery. The woman wrapped some of the things in that paper. When I came to look it over, I thought I could give some information about it, and when I told a policeman, he referred me to you. Well then, my man, I replied, sit down and tell me what you can. Nearly twelve months ago, I belonged to a brig called the Water Snake, owned and commanded by a man of the name of Walter Cuvier. I rather started at this, as Walter Cuvier was the name of the man with whom the murdered Mrs. Longmore had eloped. I was cabin boy in the water snake, and had been in that brig a couple of years. Can you tell me what Captain Cuvier did with his vessel, and what trade was he? You know, sir, that was none of my business. He traded on his own account, and I think principally in contraband goods. Well, as I said before, I was cabin boy in the water snake, and all the time I was in her, the captain had his wife with him, at least a woman who passed for his wife and I do believe that the body found in this bill was the woman we used to call Mrs. Cuvier. What makes you think so? I think I am sure of it, and I'll tell you why, sir. The captain and the missus did not live very comfortably at times, and when he was drunk he was a real brute. And the missus herself, I am certain, took a drop too much, so they had terrible shindies. Well, we came from Calcutta here, and tired of being kicked and cuffed, I determined to bolt the very first chance and give Cuvier leg bail for it. We cast anchor in the cove last May, and that very night, as I was in the pantry washing up the glasses, I heard such a row between the captain and the missus in their stateroom, she insisting on going back somewhere, crying her eyes out all the time, and he swearing he'd kill her first, until at last he told her, go back and be blank. Shortly after, the captain ordered the boat to be lowered. He took me into the cabin to help him with a box like the one described in this, and as I went back to get something he had forgotten, I saw Mrs. Cuvier getting ready to go ashore. She was dressed very handsome, and it looked like a white silk gown she had got on. She gave me a glass of wine and shook hands with me, saying she was going to leave the ship and go to her friends. I thought nothing of it, having, as I said before, heard the talk between her and the captain. Well, I and one of the sailors rowed them ashore and landed them on the beach near some trees. It was a squally, dark night. So Mrs. Cuvier shook hands with the other man and bid him goodbye. The captain told us to shove off again and wait for him in a tavern he pointed out along shore, as he had a few words to say to the missus before he went. And then he gave us the price of a drink or two, so we went off, leaving him and herself sitting on the box that he said had the woman's clothes in. That was the very last time I saw them, for as soon as my mate had a glass or two, I took the chance and made tracks, and stowed myself aboard the ship Chester, and sailed for Calcutta the next morning, and that's all I know about it. And you never saw or heard of Cuvier or his vessel since? No, sir, and if I had, I'd have given both her and him a wide berth. And I have never heard of him since. Perhaps he still lives to drag a miserable consciousness of his crime through a wretched existence. Many a time have I pictured to myself the unfortunate and guilty woman returning to the neighborhood of her husband and child whom she had disgraced and no doubt still loved and yearned to see. How often during the abuse and ill usage of him for whom she had sacrificed everything had her breaking heart prayed for the peace and rest of the home she had left, and then resolved to brave all, 
to throw herself at the feet of her injured husband, to beg the intercession of her child, did the demon murder her upon the threshold of her hopes. Within sight of the very window lights of the home she longed to enter once more. And who can tell who and what was the midnight visitor to Mr. Longmore's bedroom? Was it the bodily presence of someone acquainted with the murder, and who wished the affair to be known without being recognized? To solve the mystery in that manner seemed impossible, considering all the opposing circumstances, and thus it has remained unraveled to this day, a mystery into which I carried the closest investigation without being wiser by the inquiry. End of Mystery and Murder by James Skip Borlase.